172. I, um, <laughs> I am your host, Keith Andrew. Along here is the talented uh, San and Hunt. And I just want to say thank you for being a mm-hmm. guest on my talk show. Well, absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Now, for people who want to know what Uncensored is, Uncensored is my way of showing people that even though for war and stability, I can still overcome controversy and reach my goals in life. At the same time, I'm able to turn myself into a perfect example for people out there deaf. But, um, actually, that was my old saying. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Turn myself into a perfect example for people deaf, blind, or in a wheelchair. And at the same time, turn myself into an example for people dealing with learning disabilities. That you should never label yourself or have people label you. And you should prove to them you can step out to something. Now, I'm so used to saying deaf, blind, and in a wheelchair. I've been saying that for 167, and they're like, you can't make yourself a perfect example for people who are deaf, because one, you're not deaf, two, you're not blind, and three, you're sore as hell not in a wheelchair. So how can you be a perfect example? It's like, you're, you're missing the point, but... And that's why, I, you know, I use my old saying. But, you know, I've been saying, uh turn myself into a perfect example for people out there with a disability, but I swept out with my own disability with, with the uh, old speech. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it really doesn't make a difference, you know, at this point. Anyway, it was going to be a ramble and on. If you have a half hour, 45 minute conversation, you have as much time as you like, talk about whatever you want, and start it off, what can you tell me about yourself? Well, um, I am a professional actor and model and author, and I've been in the business, oh gosh, about 15, 16 years now. And um, some fun things about me is I am an adrenaline junkie. I have gone parasailing and cliff diving, and I love roller coasters, and my next thing on my bucket list is to go skydiving. So that's a little bit about me. (laughs) And I love your accent, by the way. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Now, when you were growing up and going to the high school class, and when you were in high school and growing up, did you ever do any sports? Were you athletic? And when you were in college, did you? What was your major in? And were you a study nerd or a party animal? Okay. Well, to let's do the first question. Actually, um, I did do sports. I played basketball in junior high, and I played uh, on the church softball league, and I ran track in high school. So I, um, I like to get outside and do those sports things and do that eye and hand coordination thing, although as I've gotten older, it's not as good as it used to be. Um, and then as far as college goes, uh, it was a little bit of both. You know, I had my time of going to the parties and hanging out with friends, and then I also really liked to study. Um, I was a little bit of a nerd, and I was okay with that. So it was a little bit of both. A little bit of both. What did you major in? Uh, I actually majored in uh, BBA, which is a Bachelor of Business Association, and I was in marketing, and I also did real estate. I also studied theater while I was in college. So um, that's kind of when the creative bug really hit me was in college. I'd never done anything as far as acting goes until college when I took a uh, theater class as an elective and then just absolutely fell in love with it, so. All right, well, did he ever get the chance to do one of those human pyramids, or are you not a human pyramid girl? I've never done a human pyramid, so I don't really know. (laughs) Would would he be up for one, or does that pass tense? Well, uh, what is it exactly? Basically, Mm -hmm. you can stack up on top of one another, and you form a shape of a pyramid. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't see why not. Well, you mentioned you were talking about your bucket list, and that's one of the things I always wanted. I know I'm a loser, but I, I love that stuff. I always wanted to do one. Yeah, no, you're not a loser. That's, that's, well, I mean, you always want to have ambitions and do things, so if you want to build a pyramid, build a human pyramid. <laughs> I'm trying to set on the record. I'm trying to set a Guinness Book of World Record attempt in a YouTube attempt. And I'm trying to get as many women together to form, you know, a giant pyramid. And I was wondering if you would be interested in taking part. Well, it depends on where at in the country you are, because I'm located in Kentucky, so (laughs) that might limit me a little bit. Right. 
Well, are you ever planning on visiting New York? I do. I actually go to New York several times a year. I have actor friends that live up there, and my husband and I, we go see shows on Broadway. So, yeah, I do actually come up there several times. All right, so maybe like over the summer you would like to hang out or something. Yeah, cool. We That's... usually do go up there in the summer, actually. <laughs> You know, as of right now, I only have two people, but if you know any girls who would be interested, I'm always looking. Okay, yeah. Now, the next question I was going to ask you is, how did you become an actress? Who influenced you, and what actors have you wanted to work with, or have worked with? I, um, I guess I really got started, like I said, in college when I took a theater class, and Denise Watkins, Professor Denise Watkins is the one who taught it, and she, um, we did a lot of improv, and I had, like I said, I'd never done any of that kind of stuff before, and um, I mean, I had modeled and was had a creative outlet that way, and I also wrote poetry, but I'd never been on stage, and so I never delved into that type of, of creative atmosphere until that college class, and I just absolutely loved it, so I can honestly say that has what has got me started in it. And as far as different people um, that I've worked with, I've been on large production sets, and I've also been on independent, um, small-budget production sets. So I was lucky enough to um, work on a set for the film Carol that stars Kate Blanchett, so that was really cool. And... Um, you know, that's going to be, I think, coming out within the next year or so for the big screen. So I'm really excited about that. And I've got to work on television series like the show Nashville and the show Resurrection. Um, so I, I've had wonderful opportunities to work with some really great people. And um, they've been really nice. I haven't met anybody that's been snotty or rude. And I can tell you that they're extremely hardworking. Because being on a film set or a television set, most people don't realize you're on set anywhere between, you know, 10 to 14 hours. And so you really get to know people and know how they are. And you got to have a lot of hard work and dedication um, to do that kind of stuff. And I don't know if people realize that or not, but it, it's a lot of fun. And I wouldn't do anything else, to be quite honest. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next question I was going to ask you, you mentioned you were a book author. I am. What books have you wrote, um, produced? And did you ever become, um, have any articles written about you? Have you ever been, uh, like a big name star out of it, self-published? I, um, I actually wrote a poetry book, and it is on Amazon. Um, you can also find it for iBooks. Um, I did have several articles written about it, uh, so I was very lucky as far as that goes, and, um, it's interesting in the poetry world because it's a lot different than writing, you know, fiction or nonfiction. And so your fan base is quite a bit different. But, um, you know, I've, I've had good luck with it and I'm really excited about it. And um, I, I just am in actually working on a second book to follow up to the first one. So we'll see how it goes. No, it's very interesting. And you know, my friend wrote a book, too. And it's also on Amazon. It's called Shattered Dreams. Mm -hmm. So if you guys like poetry, you should check it out. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the title of mine is called A Back Pocket Full of Poems by me, Shannon Hunt. <laughs> now, did you ever decide to make an audio book, or do you just want to do normal books? I have not done an audio book as of yet. It's not, you know, out of the realm of things to be done, but I just haven't done it yet. All right. Now, going back to, you know, the pyramid question, mm -hmm. <laughs> was there, uh, well, just throwing it out there, uh, was there different ideas? Because I came up with two different pyramid ideas. One is the normal one, mm -hmm. where you just uh, have the shape, and there's the one from the movie Dumbo that I would like to reenact. That's basically, you know, a stack, and you have one on top of one. You know, would you be down for anything, or... Were you not a, a fan of Dumbo and you don't want to do that one? Oh, I don't care. Either one's fine. All right, that's fine. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> I hold you towards that. I'm sorry? Well, I'm going to hold you towards the pyramid question. Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, pyramid request. You know, usually I, when I ask someone, so, yeah, sure, I would definitely do it. But then we go off the air and you're like, yeah, I only said that because we were on the air. But <laughs> I'm going to hold you towards that. <laughs> 
Anyway, but you can ask me. Do you have any questions you would like to ask me? Or well, yeah, actually, what are your goals for yourself? Like in the next five years, ten years, what are you hoping to achieve? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, one regret I have: it's ten years ago. Actually, not ten years ago. Uh, I said two. Yeah, five years ago. It was two thousand ten. People said, you know, when I turned 21, I'm now 27. They're like, oh, when you turn 21, what is it's your special birthday? And you said, do something you love. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I don't drink, I don't smoke. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask a couple people for their friendships. You know, I would like to have a couple famous friends. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I was told to go fuck myself. I was called a low wife, parasite, and mm -hmm. by a bunch of wrestlers. And one thing I regret it was I should have been doing this a long time ago, the talk show. I have no idea why it took me so long. But if I could do my life over, I would have sped it up <laughs> a lot faster. Um, to answer your question, I would really like to turn this into something. Yeah. I would like to turn the talk this into an actual talk show, uh, become a YouTube celebrity, just a famous person, just basically, I just wanted to amount to something before I die, so it's just taking it one day at a time, yeah. proving people wrong, making new friends like yourself, and it's just doing the right thing and having fun with it. Okay. Well, I will tell you this, you don't necessarily have to be famous to be worth anything or do anything in life, so don't don't get that stuck in your head, okay? Because, I mean, what you're doing now is great and is important. So don't don't link that to being famous. Just keep doing you and, uh, you know, do what the goals that you want to do. But, you know, don't don't necessarily base that on being famous. No, absolutely. And the one thing I promised myself and I promised my um, mother and father, uh, I would never change. So even if I do become famous, I would stay humbled. And, like, for example... Um, I worked with this girl, I can't remember her name, I think her name was Roxy or Kelsey, and her family basically, you know, before you get the hand gesture, <laughs> had a lot of money, but she stayed humble. She said, I didn't want any hand downs, I wanted to earn stuff for myself, and I used her for an inf ins uh, inspiration, so hey, I'm going to do the same thing, if I win the lottery, yeah, if I won that, uh, I don't know if you ever heard about the PC Clarence house where you win a thousand dollars a week. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I win that, I would never change. I would still work in retail. I would still do what I'm doing now, and I would basically, you know, if someone asked me, if he asked me if I won, what would I do with the money? You know, I would say, basically, use it as a crutch. <laughs> and what I mean by use it as a crutch it means. Yeah, and that's my way of saying use it as a safety net. You know, God forbid one day my parents aren't here anymore and I'm on my own. I need something to fall back on. You know, yeah, but you say, oh, well, we're friends and I may fall back on you, but maybe you will go off using you for an example. You're doing your own life and you can't rely on people, so that's what I'm hinting towards. That you can't rely on people, you have to stand on your own two feet. And I'm sorry to impose on you, by the way. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. Yeah, but uh, but I would you actually use it as a safety net. Just save as much money as I can and just live on it. You know, it's like, well, we have all this money. Well, you can buy a big fancy house. You can buy a buy of a car. Buy a hot girlfriend. Yeah, that's great and everything. But like you said, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in ten years? And you should be careful with money, and most importantly, you should right. just, to me, you should stay humble. Yeah, stay humble and do whatever it is that you're doing in life for the art of it. Like, I, I love acting, and if, if in the end it ends up becoming um, a really big thing for me, that's great. But that's not the that's not the reason I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I love the art form of it, So, and, um, and, and everything that goes into it from... 
you know, learning the lines to meeting new people to the production crew to all of that. I love the the whole business of it. So that's why I love to do it, and that's why I still do it, and I will always do it because of the art. That's true, and there's a lot of people that say, just using you for an example, say the same thing. I love doing it, but they, not saying you would, and mm -hmm. no disrespect, but mm -hmm. the people. Do you think it eventually changes you? Like for you, do you think it changed you a little bit, or do you think you're the same person as you started? I think that, um, you know, as, as you get a little bit bigger in the industry, you have more influences than what you did when you first started. So depending on how people handle those influences, whether it be, you know, management team or an agent or family or, or whatever that may be, um, I think that changes. The core of people typically don't, but it's how I think they react to those influences at the, as they get a little bit bigger in the industry is what really makes the difference. No, absolutely. I agree with you. Now, you also had started off as a model. I did. <laughs> and this may be an embarrassing question, but I'm just going to throw it out to you. Okay. Have you ever been approached to um, pose for Playboy? No, no, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I don't quite have that build for a Playboy. I am started out as a runway model, so very tall and very slender. So I don't quite have that Playboy built, but if they had ever approached me, I don't think that that's something that I would have done. It's not something that I'm interested or in that industry. Now, for those ladies and gentlemen that are in it, you know what, more to you, happy for you, you do you, and I'll do me. And that's just kind of how I look at it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you started acting, uh, what was your first role? Were you an extra? And um, two questions. The first yeah. one is, when you started, were you an extra, and where are you now? Are you like a secondary star, supporting star? I have done everything from being background work to principal to supporting to lead. So it just, um, you know, when I actually the very first job that I ever got was was a theater job. Um, it was in it was for. A, a show called Ghost to Frankfurt, and I was actually the lead in it, which was amazing because a lot of times that doesn't happen. And then when I started doing um, some television work, I did background work. I've also done some co-starring stuff. So, I mean, I've done everything and will continue to do it just because I love the art. I'm not the, the actor that says, oh, if I don't get the lead, I'm not going to do it. That's not who I am. I love everything about it so if it's the supporting if it's you know whatever even if it's a two-line thing i'm okay with that because i just want to be involved now the second part is when what is your um advice for people who, who are starting out and who want to become an actress and well i'm going to ask you about an actress a model and a mm -hmm. book author but it's the same question but three categories but i'm going to start off First, the first one, if for people who want to become an actress, mm -hmm. what would the steps you put? What would you, your advice be? Oh, <laughs> there's a lot of advice for that. Um, the most important thing, I think, for most anybody in the industry, no matter what it is, modeling, acting, writing, directing, whatever that is, is to believe in yourself to know that you are enough because in the industry you're going to be told no a lot more than you're going to be told yes. So you have to know, um, you have to have a thick skin and um, and you just, you have to be ready for it. And being ready for it is having the proper headshots, having the correctly formatted resume, um, being sure that you're educated in whatever field that you're going into to know who the key players are in the industry, knowing the difference between film acting, television acting, stage acting, because there are differences. And to be sure that you're educated on those, take workshops if you want to, work with acting coaches, um, and be persistent. Stay at it. You'll get better over the years, and you really just you have to have a thick skin and, and just be prepared, really. Oh, that's true. And 
I guess in a way I do have a thick skin or I'm not stubborn. Uh -huh. <laughs> because when people say no to me, I, I don't give up. I'm very persistent and I keep working on person until I get a no to a yes. And that you know, and that's and that's what you have to do. And um, of course, networking is important too, because once you reach a certain level, everybody has got talent. And then it's more about facilitating relationships with key people that are in the industry, because they will work with people that they know, like, and trust. And once you develop that relationship, you know, with whomever that might be—a casting director or a producer or whatnot—then um, you know you can expand your network and, and get better work. That's true. Mm -hmm. Now, for people who want to be like a book writer, like mm -hmm. use me for an example. Mm -hmm. Like I started, uh, I wrote a book called "When You Overcome Controversy, Dreams Do Come True." Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I had to pull it because you know it wasn't trying to find a demo. It was basically like this, and it. And I wanted it to be like a small hardcover book, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, it was this. So it was more like a, a magazine thing, okay. but I pulled it because there was a lot of spelling errors, and I only had 57 pages. As a book author, one to another, uh -huh. what advice would he give me, and is 57 pages good enough, or...? Well, it depends on, on how you want to release it. Like, if you just want to strictly do um, an online thing, I mean, 57 pages is fine. But if you're wanting to do a, a, a hardback book, then you probably want to do a little bit more than that. And, you know, the biggest thing is making sure that your, your content is well written, um, making sure that you don't have the spelling errors, uh, having an editor. Um, and if you can't hire an editor, then you need to be sure you have people that you know that can go through books and look through mistakes and, you know, content errors and you know, things like that, to make sure that you have the best possible product that you could present to a publisher. Because if you give them something that's not, you know, fully presentable, it's going to be real tough. Now, do you think it's easier to make an audio book, or do you think it's easier to do a normal book? Um, you know, I strictly did the online thing. I did not do, um, you know, hardback publishing. So, um you know, and you can do the same thing through audio with that as well. As you can, you know, just do an, uh, an online thing with that versus putting out a CD or, you know, wh however it is that they put, they do that now. Um, but it's, I don't know, I mean, it's relatively the same. It still has to be packaged correctly and the syntax has to be correct and, you know, things like that. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it just has to have a nice pretty bow on it. <laughs> That's true. Now, do you have any funny stories or funny pranks that you pulled on people or people pulled on to you? Um, you know what? I've been pretty lucky as not far as um, not having pranks pulled on me. Um, the only thing I used to do, I can remember as a child to my cousins, is I would hide in a closet or hide, you know, somewhere to try to scare them. Like, that, that was our game, was to try to scare each other and who could make each other scream the loudest, but... Other than that, no, I mean, those are just little kid pranks, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the funny stories I was remembering last night, um, when my dad was growing up, he, he once just so I'm funny, I don't remember exactly, but he lived in an apartment with his parents, and he it was in the city, and I think it was on Strong Street, he was on the 50th, <laughs> uh, you okay? Now he so lived in Strong Street on a 57th floor, and my grandmother used to make a meat, and it wasn't the good meat. It was the meat it was kind of veiny. Oh. <laughs> so okay. when she wasn't looking, my dad and his and my uncle and my brother, I mean my dad, his, his brother, who's his uncle, my uncle, and uh, grand my grandfather used to chuck the meat out the window. <laughs> so my grandma used to come back, oh, it's all gone? Oh, you want me to make some more for you? So one day when my dad threw it out the window, it hit the, <laughs> they hit the super in the face. Oh, no. 
So, and the super says, I don't know, at a certain time, uh, so it looks like it starts raining meat. The, the ever funny story was, uh, let's see, what was it? There's a bunza bump, but I'm just trying to think of what really stands out. Um, my cat knows how to open doors. So, we didn't, we, uh, this guy, McGuire, came in, he's, he works on the floors. And, uh, when we're getting the floors done, we put the cats in the basement. So, all of a sudden, he's working and everything, he hears, Hello, 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 and he thought there's someone locked in the basement. So, he opened the door, and all the cats, <laughs> all the cats came running out. <laughs> and we didn't tell him that Mr. Molly knows how to open the door. Uh -huh. So he gets all the cats back, he puts them in the basement. He takes a couple steps away from the door. We don't have the round handle, we have to flip one. <laughs> Next thing you know, Molly stretches up and he flicks the handle and the door opens and he all of a sudden you hear, son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> so he did. Same thing, he scurried all the cats in the basement. Molly tried opening the door again, and this time he put his hand on the door so he wouldn't be able to. And all of a sudden, Molly goes, No, no. <laughs> ah, those are my funny stories. <laughs> those are pretty good. I used to have um, a long haired calico cat, and um, actually, no, it wasn't a calico, it was a tabby, sorry. And he was a little French cat, or that's what I thought he was in my mind. And we had named him Thomas and the Fluff and called him Fluffy. And that was the smartest cat. I mean, he could get in anywhere. He could open up doors. I would find him hanging in the closet on my clothes. You know, he would <laughs> climb up there and just hang on the clothes. I don't know what this cat was thinking, but he was a crazy cat, but I loved him anyway. <laughs> just Thomas the Fluff. <laughs> Now, wrapping up, do you have anything you want to say to your fans and listeners, or do you have any topics you would like to talk about? After all, this is your time. You know, anything and everything. I, what I, I'm talk about whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, well, I haven't really done this as a way, but I can do it for this episode. You know, I like to make things different. You know, season one, I ask hard hitting questions like, mm -hmm. where do you stand on marijuana? Uh, legalizing marijuana, legal and um, gun rights and gun controls. And I wanted season two to be different. You know, it's like this, more interactive and more mm -hmm. you know, human-like. Mm -hmm. Season three, I'm going to start interviewing two people at the same time. You know, just to shake it up and make it different. But, you know, so far I've been hitting a roadblock with that because, you know, it's the computer and everything. But... If you don't mind asking, if you mind me for asking, I have two hard-hitting questions for you. Okay. And the first one is, where do you stand on legalizing marijuana? That is a very good question. Um, I don't know. I think it can be both um, bad and good. I think for the people who, you know, need it medically, um, they get it in some states, but they don't get it in all states, so that might, you know, help with that. Um, I also think people might use it at it as an excuse to um, just get high all the time, and I think unless it's really needed for a, a medical use for somebody that I don't know. I mean, is it something that you have to have to function on every day, like water or food? No. But, you know, I don't I don't judge people and to each their own. It's not something I personally do. I um, was never interested in doing it. But, you know, there are lots of people out there who do. So, I don't know. Really, that is a tough, tough question. No, I agree with you. You know, but I, well, first off, it's a plant. And yeah. God grows it. Yeah. So if God grows it, then I guess it's okay. But you're right, you know, people do misuse it and, and abuse it, and that's where all the problems start. Right. But look at it like this. You have drinking and smoking. Right, I know. Yeah, and both of those things causes cancer. I know. And if anything, smoking weed, you know, it improves memory. 
it helps the sarcoma yeah. and it's actually in a way pretty more and pretty much healthier for you yeah I mean I don't know I, like I agree and I disagree it just I don't know it, it's tough it, it really is tough and like I said I don't condone um, I don't do it but you know for those that do that's you know that's their life but I don't know. I, I have seen a lot of people that have gone down that road, and it just has not, you know, turned out well for them. So, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm in the same boat. I, uh, I knew people the same way. Yeah. Now, the next question is, was everything going on in ISIS? Mm -hmm. well, what's your opinion about it? Oh, ISIS. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they are obviously a militant group of a religion who has assigned, for whatever reason, um, that they need to kill people to get their point across, and they, they, they've hit under religion, which they shouldn't do that, because it gives all Muslim people um, a bad name. And, and you're going to have that, I think, in every religion mm -hmm. where you have a sect that has gone off and, and done something terrible, and um, I just, I, I wish that people could see religion for a good thing and not misuse it um, to get to their own selfish reasons, whether it be for power or, or whatever it is that ISIS is looking for. I just, I wish that people would use it for good like it's supposed to be used for good. Not, not for evil. It's they've turned something good into something evil, and and I think that that is just, I think that's terrible. I really do. That's true. You know, like what Bill Maher says, uh, organized religion is a sign of mental illness. <laughs> well, I don't necessarily think that. I think that. Um, organized religion first started off, you know, thousands of years ago as a way to explain the unexplained. And, you know, as it's progressed throughout the years, you know, people have, have used it for for different reasons, for power, for... Um, but in, in essence, I think the true purpose of it is just to bring the good out in humanity. But people have taken that and turned that into something not good and um, I don't know, I, I really, I just wish that religion could be used, all religions, for all people, could be used as a good thing and not a bad thing. That's true, and if they're going to do it right, then it, it should just say, because I believe in God, I believe in the devil. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I used to go to temple, mm -hmm. but, you know, ever since they raked up the prices, you know, because they wanted more money. I was like, yeah, I want no, want no part of it. Right. But I do believe in God, and uh, basically it's a yin and yang, you know. Right. Good, bad, up, down. But if you're saying, if they're going to kill a name, then did I say you're, you're, because there's no God out there, period, that you kill a name, unless right. you believe in the devil. Right. So unless you worship, worship in the devil, then okay, I understand by, you know, you can't take it in God's name in vain. That's just the stupidest thing I ever heard. Right, you know, and that's what I'm saying, that I think that it's awful that they're taking, you know, a religion and, and turning it into something like that. And I just, I don't know, it breaks my heart, to be honest. It really does. It just breaks my heart. Because I want, I mean, obviously there's going to be good and bad because there has to be a balance it, but um, I just wish that there was a lot more good than bad. And they do things that, um, you know, get the attention of the media. And, um, you know, whether that's good or bad, I, I don't know if that perpetuates, you know, a certain image that they're wanting. And I don't know. I just, I just don't think it's good or right. And that's just it, I guess. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, wrapping up, do you have anything you want to say to your fans and listeners? Um, hi. <laughs> uh, please uh, keep, you know, keep on the lookout for me. Um, 
you know, you can find me on Twitter at sh underscore author. Um, you can find me on Facebook under Shane and Hunt. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. So, you know, please connect with me because I, I want to stay, you know, in contact with people and um, and create art. That's what I want to do.